Okay, hello everyone. This is the first time I'm actually doing a webinar on Twitch, so I hope you can all, all hear me. <clears throat> so I was thinking, taking a few minutes to to talk about something uh, you know that we've been working on a lot <clears throat> the last years uh, at Lightband, but also something that I've been thinking about a lot. You know, where we both a little bit where we are today, but also some some thoughts where we would like to go with future in the in the future. And uh, it evolves a lot around you know, cloud and edge and what we're doing with Calix. But also most of these things do apply to Akka as well. Uh, so the, this uh, session is titled uh, Tackling the Cloud to Edge Continuum. And uh, I'll hope, hope hopefully you will get some more clarity what I well, what I mean by that throughout this um, this this uh, this talk. So my name is Jonas Bonier. I'm the I'm the CEO and and founder of Lightman. I'm also the uh, the creator of Aka. Um, based in Sweden. Uh, so let's get let's get started. You know today is infrastructure in general the cloud infrastructure is is really ama amazing it's it's so it's so good that it's it's almost you know we've been spoiled by all this great cl cloud infrastructure i think to to the point where we're almost taking it for granted it's almost hard to remember how how it was uh, but well like what, 10 12 years back or 15 years back you know when when we just started tinkering with the cloud how hard it actually was and how much work we had to do and reinvent the re reinvent the wheel over and over again. You know, I'm talking about the world before containers and and, and virtualization and Kubernetes and and the whole ecosystem around Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Yeah. I remember, you know, when we and I started Arc in two thousand you know, eight nine. You know, the the first years back then in you know two thousand nine two thousand ten, we had to all the work we had to do to to make it you know Arca run efficiently on on-prem and also in in, in AWS for, for 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 clients, you know, work that every client had had to redo over and over again. So it's it's, it's very you know it's, it's definitely the state of the art is amazing when it comes to cloud infra infrastructure. But but it's I don't think it's all good, you know. It's like it's been it's been also becoming very very complex. Like there are almost too much of the good stuff there are too many good product pro products you know there are too there, there there's too much decisions that we're all drowning in, in in order to ensure you know that we we take you know that we do what's best for for the specific app or the specific use case or the, or the specific customer so, so uh, it's um, you know the options that we are all facing can sometimes be completely overwhelming and and almost be a, a, like a a blocking factor when it comes to decisions and, and moving for mo moving forward. This image is actually directly from the CNCF website, and it shows the you know, the vast ecosystem that we have now under you know under CNCF, which is completely staggering. You know, but but at the same time, how could someone navigate this efficiently? Do we do I need to learn about all these products? And uh, in order, in order to choose which ones to use, or do, and, and and once I've chosen, you know, I don't know, five, five, ten, or whatever is needed, three to seven, I don't know, you know, how 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 do I make sure that they're all work 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 together? You know, how can I compose them? And and as as most people that's been, you know, including myself, you know, learned the hard way that when you when you when you're composing sort of you know sort of distinct sort of subsystems or products into a larger cohesive whole uh, in a one single system is usually at the at the edges that, that things break. How can we ensure that our SLAs are kept when we move from one product to another and compose them? How can we ensure that you know data integrity and consistency and all these hard things are maintained for us? Um, that's really, really hard. And the answer probably differs depending on which of these products you you are you are putting together, so to speak. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 uh, a, matter, a matter of fact, many of us are stuck uh, maintaining, and first building and maintaining a non, a non-trivial -tri application stack ourselves. 
which includes, you know, in the simplest case, often a low balancer, ingress router, some sort of API gateway, caches. We, we usually built our system in some sort of app framework for microservices. And if often we need some eventing as well, which means that we need like an event broker, some sort of message broker. We need to put it all in a database. And, and often your different type of use cases means different type of databases to make sure that we optimize data in, you know, you know, you know storage and queries uh fully depending on the use case and all of this is of course very very hard you know you know most uh, applications then sort of need to have fully staffed operations and 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 uh, and uh, you know 24 by 7 making sure that all of this you know co co continues to function and ticks forward uh you know i guess i was really excited when i when i when i when i first learned about about serverless you know lambda amazon lambda uh, i think was really revolutionary when it, when it came out. It was really pointed towards the future, you know, for a new, better world in a way. And and but for me, serverless has always been a developer experience. You know, I think it's it's too good. It's too uh, revolutionary. It's too forward thinking to be sort of only uh, uh, sort, of, sort of bundled together or were used in, in one type of product, uh, you know, function as a service, where, it's, where, where it originated. I think, I think, I think, honestly, I think it's the, it's the future of how all cloud applications will be written. And also, as we'll talk about how I think Edge will be, I mean, how people will develop for the Edge uh, as well. It's really the future of, 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 of the way we, we will write and consume software, I think. So it's way bigger than the function as a service, which is which I'm very grateful for, you know, as as the, being the, the the sort of the starting point for it. Serverless really means, at least for me, you know, it means a lot of things. But one thing, one one of the main sort of, sort of traits of serverless is zero ops, meaning 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 that you, you that you don't have to carry the burden of of running and operating the code. All you need to do, you know, if 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 Xerops lives up to its promise, is to focus on building the code and committing it, you know, to whatever repository or like throw or throw it up into the cloud, into whatever platform you are running. And and um, you know, as I said again, fast really showed the way here, but in a way, it gets stuck halfway. You know, it, it addressed communication and workflow and and this like data data pipelining type of use cases very very well. But in a more stateless manner, that definitely is a big piece of the puzzle in how we build applications today. But it's just a piece, you know. It's it's sort really of ignored the biggest, uh, the hardest problem distributed in, di di in distributed systems, in my opinion, which is state. How do you manage state in a distributed system? Uh, and don't just like put it over in a database somewhere. But how can you actually efficiently manage state inside your application? inside your services, how you communicate, how you, co how you, co how you coordinate it, et cetera. Uh, and also it didn't do such a good job of fully abstracting over, over all infrastructure. It abstracted over the message broker to, to, to really make messaging sort of a part of the programming model. But not necessarily, you know, databases and caches, API gateways, and all these other things that that, that you have. Of course, it varies depending on the on the on the product. But but it um, you know, functions as a service leaned itself very you know, mostly to stateless type of workloads. So, and and uh, and also, you know, I when it comes to serverless, many many applications or, or products today call themselves serverless. Which is great, I think, and provide a serverless experience. But they all all do so in the, in the individually. You know, like databases are serverless, message brokers are serverless, you know, event-based systems are serverless, caches are serverless, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's all great, but it actually leaves developer with a complex integration project. So even if even if all these APIs are truly serverless, we still have to stitch them all together into one single functional system. Which is can also be very hard. Okay. So the question is that I've been sort of pondering the last couple of years or so, or, or so is can we can we do better? What lies beyond serverless? And I say what lies beyond the current incarnation or the current state of the art when it comes to serverless? I really believe that we can we can do better. We can we we can take yet another 
sort of step in this in the ladder of, of abstractions and making the life easier for the for the for, for developers. And what I think we really need to do is uh, is 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 uh, is vertical integration. It's Stephen O'Grady at Red Monkey he wrote this article, this, this great article where he talks about vertical integration, the collision between app platforms and the database. And, and one of the quotes in this, in the, in this article is, uh, there, there are already too many primitives for engineers to deeply understand and manage them all, and more arrive by the day. And even if that, was not, that were not the case, there is too little upside for the overwhelming majority of organizations to select, implement, integrate, operate, and secure every last component and ser or service. Time spent managing enterprise infrastructure is time not spent building its own business. Okay. And, and, and you know, uh, going back to Alfred North Whitehead's, you know, timeless wisdom here, you know, civilization advance, advances by extending the number of important uh, operations which we can form without think, think, thinking about them. And I think this quote very much applies to, to, the, to the software industry. We need to continue climbing the ladder of abstractions and, and, and automate, um, you know, making as much as possible as like, a, like, a, like a, a commodity that we don't have to think about. So I think we need to move from serverless to, you know, database-less is like, is like, is like one, one thing, or, or for serverless to fully uh, uh, um, sort of incorporate ver vertical integration completely. I think so. So if we if we if we take a look at how the application stack looked like when you know, or still looks if you're running it on prem, but looked like you know ten years ago as well. Uh, the red uh, sort of sort of uh, boxes here is that is, is things that you as a as a as a user as a developer or you as a company has 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 to manage by yourself. Of course, when you when you, when you run a self-managed on-prem, it's everything. It's the business logic is the frameworks, is the database, is the transport security, Kubernetes, if you happen to run that, operating systems, all, all the way down to the hard to the hardware. The problem is with the with the cloud is that it got us basically half halfway. The the cloud providers now now, now provide great Kubernetes services that you that you that you can just throw up Docker containers on. on of course, you know all everything from hardware all the way up to the operating system. But still, you know the rest is is still on us as developers to to a large to a large extent. What we need, I think, is 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 a, is a new sort of category of platforms that 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 sort of out in in which you can outsource everything but the business logic. There's really no reason why we can't why serverless and and future serverless platforms should be able to manage everything but the business logic for you uh, and still allow you to not just build a subset of the applications that, that you that you want, but actually build general purpose, real full-blown business applications or enterprise applications. So uh, so I think this is, the, at, least, at least for me, this is the vision that I have and I think what, what, what we need to move towards. And this is a great example of vertical integration where the platform sort of takes care of ever, almost everything but the thing that it can't, you know, your business logic. And, and by doing so, removes all, all complexity in, like, in, in, in sort of setting it up, running it, managing, upgrading it, et cetera, you know, uh, for the whole lifetime of the application. So, so, so that is where 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 we are with with cloud today, and where I think we we need to go. And you know, this of course, you know, this is something that we've been working on a lot with Enlightenment, and and I think we have we have a, we have a solution, you know, to to this vertical integration problem in Calix. But I'll get back to more to that later. I just want to say some some things about edge computing as well. You know, edge, um, edge, I think, is really the natural extension of the cloud. It's not really a separate thing. It's, it's, it's really, I see it really as a continuum, as, as, as I'll talk more about later. Gartner said in 2021 that edge computing is actually being implemented today in many of our clients' environments, enabling entirely new applications and data models. S simply put, edge has moved from concept and hype into successful vertical industry implementations with general purpose platform status approaching rapidly. And uh, 
I, I can really echo this when 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 talking to our to our clients. You know, many in the in the global two thousand uh, uh, category. You know, they sort of they are they're really sort of starting to to embrace edge, uh, but many do so in an in a sort of ad hoc way, uh, and and sort of. Most of them are, I'd say all, you know, but many of them are struggling with how to combine cloud, cloud and edge, and and I think that's that's unfortunate, uh, as I will get to, just in a second. Uh, you know, it's 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 clear, uh, you know, that there's of course been a lot of hype hype around edge the last five five years or so, but it's it's definitely not just talk. You know, the edge is already here, at least in my experience, talking to a lot of these companies. Uh, we already have really, really, re so really well built out edge infrastructure. So the the cloud providers often, you know, the, so they they provide most of them provide you know small data centers out out at the edge. Data centers they're scaled down, but but still allow a, a programming environment or or ops environment that are very very similar to to the one in the in the in the regular cloud you know you can often run kubernetes in these like it, having some in these sort of edge 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 clusters cdn networks have all you know they they allow you to attach compute to 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 you know to static data that they've always always served you know we we've seen in companies like like Cloudflare and Fastly and so on, be, you know, coming up with with programming models to 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 allow you to run comp computations out there, and, uh, and 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 like furthest out, or actually not furthest, but furthest is probably the devices themselves. But before we make the jump to the devices themselves, you know, we have we, we have the telcos that allows running applications inside the actual cell towers for the lowest latency possible. And 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 really and and five five G and this new trend of local first software is really changed changed in the game here. Uh, it's 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 too it's, it's too big of a topic to go into how five G and so on will 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 change the game. But I really think that it will enable a completely new category of use cases and 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 allow companies to serve their customers, you know, in a much much more reliable and and better way, faster and and and. And, and and more reliable way, and and um, you know the, it's it's nothing to be surprised about because customers, you know they're they they have always become more and more picky and more and more demanding every year, and and uh, and you know have having the ability to move data and compute, you know closer and closer to where the end users you know is, uh, like physically. It's 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 of course something that 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 uh, you know can um, can be a, a, like a, a competitive advantage for many for many uh, for many companies and because because how being able to to co-locate data compute and end user means that you you can really serve those users with you know, really really ultra low latency and really really amazing availability. Because if you already have compute and data right there where the user is, there's no need to go and go fetch it somewhere else, which means that that latency is, is not necessary. And also, if the if you know the the, the database that, that you're using down in the back end cloud or something goes down or the network goes down, you you're still fine. You can just continue to serving those users as, as nothing has happened because you have the data that's needed right where you are. You know, so so I think that's that's very very exciting, and uh, and we are you know moving what beyond edge computing. In the last five years, mostly I think most have talked about compute moving compute out to the edge, but I really think that's only half of the story. Being able to be stateful and having a sort of holistic approach to compute and data in physical you know proximity to where the user is is really what's going to change change the game here. And uh, just you know, giving you some numbers is really a huge market on the rise here. And Gartner has pre predicted that in 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 that in you know, 2020, which was all already the case. You know, we, it was like 4.6 billion, uh, and, it, and and it will go up to 61.1 billion. Uh, uh, so to which is you know quite 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 a rapid uh, rise. 
And what kind of edge use cases are do we see out there? You know, this is just a, a sort of short, a short, a short list. It's, there's of course many, many more. But you know, some of the ones that I've, I've personally been been involved in are autonomous vehicles, you know, retail, trading systems, healthcare, emergency services, factories, stadium events. You know, serving sports and concerts and these type of things uh, very efficiently, local locally. And you know, gaming, of course, falls into that category often. Farming, financial services, smart homes, etc. So, so you know, there's there's a growing list here of where edge use cases can really change 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 the game. And and also, you know, tsunami warning here. Gartner predicts that in 2025, but 75 percent of all enterprise generated generated data, uh, I mean, all generated data will be created and processed at the edge itself and that is that is an increase from from about 10 percent today i think today was actually last year if i remember correctly uh, you know this is this is this is a game changer and it's and it's this this of course means you know that 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 sort of, sort of, that we have to keep as much data at the edge, edge as edge as possible we have to move processing at the edge so we so we can actually tackle as much data as absolutely possible out there, and not having to put like, like shove it, or we'll channel it all the way back to the to, to the back end cloud and do processing there, and then going back with the with the intelligence or the or the end or the answers or the you know the insights that you might have from processing that 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 data. We need to be able to process that out on the edge itself. And I've already talked about that. You know, the, the benefits are, are obvious. Real-time processing, meaning faster answers to the users. Uh, you know, things can be way more resilient, as I talked about, because we don't have the we we don't rely on a stable connection to the back end cloud. And it can also be a lot more resource efficient and env environmentally friendly, you know, have, have help, help, help helping tackling you know, uh, climate change and, and, and consuming less energy, which is, you know, we all want to do in these these days. So all this, all this is quite exciting, you know. That said, you know, it's it's of course all trade-offs, and and uh, I'll go into that in a second. But first, I just want to say that you know, edge means different things for different people, and the the way I see it is a sort of a hierarchy of layers. It's not black and white. It's not either you're in the cloud or you're in the edge, and there's nothing in between. It's sort of it's sort of a lot of gray area here. Uh, you know, some call uh, the so first. I mean, there's there's definitely more than two. I think, but but if we like to be have to, if it should be like recently coarse grained here, we have at least you know cloud, near edge, far edge, and the devices. You know, some call them far edge edge cloud clusters. Some call near edge regional. You know, there's we haven't really sort of settled on a on a on a on a good um, uh, common vocabulary here. I think, but. But it's really, it's, it's really, you know, more and more of stuff, you know, more and more nodes, more and more of sort of points of presence, this all the way up to the devices, you know, where they can be literally hundreds of millions, you know, depending on what kind of use case you have. So, and, and the interesting thing is that, you know, each one of these layers has its own opportunities for us as developers. But also, it's it's limitations, and sometimes we need to lean into the constraints and lean into the limitations to really get those opportunities. So, if I should just you know walk you through a little bit the way I see it, at least you know, is that further out towards the devices on the right hand on the left hand side, and you have further in towards the cloud, so down uh, on the on the on the right hand side. So further out towards the devices, as I said, you have um, you have looked like more and more and more things, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pops to co co to coordinate. While further down the cloud is is usually sometimes in, in the intense or up to thousands of nodes to to co coordinate. Further out, you usually have more unreliable networks and hardware. While further in, you know, you can usually trust the networks and be and and there and you know. In in public clouds today, the you know the hyperscalers cloud clouds you they're usually very very reliable you know comparatively at least, and same and same holds for hardware. Uh, further out, you have more limited resources and and, com and computational power, which of course influences the way you design and think about these things you know underneath. While we're further down in towards the cloud, you have your vast resources and compute power. 
Further out, you have I mean, it leans itself more to real time, low latency processing, as we talked about. You, you can directly out there com do compute and return with the with the answer immediately. But further in, you have more batch, high latency processing. Uh, uh, further out, you I mean, you, have, you usually have weaker consistency guarantees. It's like you you you're, you're essentially forced to to have a, have a, have a model that can work with weaker consistency guarantees and. While while for further in you have we're spoiled to 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 be able to put things in a strongly consistent database and and and, and lean on strong consistency. Uh, you know further out, you know we we can take local decisions, faster decisions, and less but less also less accurate decisions because there's less per com computational power, and and we usually want to want to return you know answers uh, in real time. Further in towards the cloud, you know, of course we have we can look more globally. We can make decisions on a more global data set, but it's it's definitely slower. While better, you know, better in the terms we can take more intelligent decisions. So often I see sort of a, hi a, hi a hybrid approach where we can we can we can we we can get reasonably good decisions immediately back to the user, while we then also channel all data back to the cloud for more sort of batch processing, it's probably not batch processing these days, but more in line with batch processing, it takes more time to do more thorough analysis. And once we reach, you know, some sort of, of, um, of intelligence, you know, we can funnel that back out to the edge and that can influence, you know, the edge uh, um, services out there. Further out is definitely more resilient and available, you know, from the perspective of the, of, of the system, you know, or or from the perspective of the user, that said, you know the hardware is less is, is less reliable, so it definitely affects the way you the way you d design. But having data and compute and the user at the same time place, you know, leads itself towards more resilience and more available systems. And you know, contrary, less resilient and available from the perspective of the user out there, uh, uh, if you put things in the cloud. And and for, for, and, for and further out re requires you know more fine grained data replication and, and mobility. You, you need to move with the user, you know, compute and state move, need to move with the user as it as it moves, you know, thinking, for example, autonomous vehicles or whatever, you know, actually driving physically. And, and as you as you move, you know, across the country, you know, the data often needs to move with you. Uh, uh, but while further in, you know, you can you can rely on more coarse grain data replication and, and more more traditional ways of thinking. And, and and designing the the application. So so what do we need to 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 tackle all of these like like very different requirements? Uh, I think I, I think we need you know one of the cornerstones in the way I've always thought about software you know comes from the actor model in which you have autonomous self organizing components. We call we call them actors. So I think that's a, that's a model that really works very well out on the edge. As I said, we need physical co-location of data, compute, and end user. They are that can usually be abstracted by these autonomous self-organizing components, sort of actor-ish type of components. We need also intelligent and adaptive placement of data, compute, and end user. We need some intelligence in knowing where data should be. Ideally, you know, if possible, predict where the user should be and able to put state right there in advance. That's not always possible and can sometimes be very hard to do, but the, you know, but at least do it very, with very low latency on demand and and there's a so there's a lot of in, very interesting research you know martin kleppman and 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 many others you know are doing around local first cooperation or local first software in in which which you know so you invert the way you look at it the system you know should should work fine completely fine uh, in in you know completely locally you know and and if we happen to have a, a, a cloud that we can use, sometimes or all the time, then we happen. Then we then we do that. But we don't. We are not reliant on always you know, using like a database over there or or some cloud services over here. But we can, we can we can function fine inside factories, for example, or 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 inside stores, like or etc. Uh, it's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. I, I encourage you to, to look into that more. And of course, like fine grain and adaptive replication, the further out you are on the edge, 
we need to be more and more fine grained, you know, be able to do replication selectively, not replicate everything everywhere. That simply doesn't work, it simply doesn't scale. And, it's, uh, 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 and how do you do that then? Ideally in adaptive way, so the system can learn and, and optimize itself along the way as, it, as, as it's being used. And there's also no such thing as like once it's all, one size fits all when it comes to consistency here. We need tools for eventual consistency, causal consistency and strong consistency and, and have them sort of work together in concert in, 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 in good ways. And the way I, I view it is that, you know, and the way we looking at that we have solved in, in, in Calyx is that we have options for, for what we call state models. They're like shapes of your data. Uh, uh, so that sort of can be tied to a specific consistency model, a specific replication model, et cetera. Uh, a little bit more high level way of, of reasoning about, you know, replication and consistency uh, by just looking at what, you know, what my state models means and what kind of semantics it has. And of course, end-to-end -end guarantees, you know, I mean, we, we need the system to, to take full responsibility, you know, all the way. And, and, and naturally that's very hard if you as a developer has to stitch together multiple different pieces that you don't own, that you perhaps have just downloaded or, or bought or whatever. Uh, uh, we need platforms that can really take, take responsibility of end-to-end -end guarantees of the SLAs. So, 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 so my vision is that, is that what we need is, a, is what I call the cloud to edge data plane. Serve sort of an abstraction or platform that can sort of allows us to build application in this cloud to edge continuum. And because it really is a continuum, the way, the way I view it, you know, it's, it's really if you run in the cloud or if you run in the edge, should not be a design decision. Definitely not. You don't want to hard code that. It shouldn't be a development decision. It, it should be, it's, it, 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 and you know, it should actually not even be a, de a deployment de 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 decision. It should ideally be a runtime decision, but it, sh it should at least be a deployment decision that you can choose to say, I want to put this thing over here and that over the that thing over there, and and and. But you know, as 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 always, it's really hard to predict how the application is being is being used. And 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 uh, you know, dip, and if you get sort of what we used to call slash dotted when I, you know when I started you know like Black Friday so whatever you know it's like the system need to adaptively scale and, and work with with how it's actually being used to today which means scale up and scale down and, and move things around so ad adaptiveness is extremely important here <clears throat> it's of course really important also then that these these services are truly location transparent that they can run anywhere. From the public, from the public cloud, out to like thousands of pops out at the edge. Uh, so, how can we then find though the, the these right abstractions? You know, Timothy Keller said that freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding the right ones, the liberating restrictions. I think you know I've learned often the hard way, you know, but I also learned to really appreciate constraints and the fact that constraints can actually be liberating it's not just true for software of course it's true for for everything but i i think it's sort of been been something that's been guiding you know the way i've been thinking about software for many years and the way i've been designing products and apis that that you know constraint the right type of constraints is are you often uh, and having them in you know, a first class, these constraints like that's also been a hallmark in, in always been a hallmark in 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 building Akka, that these constraints of the network and the constraints that we see distributed systems should be first class, and and that can be liberating in in how we how we how we de de design software. So if we if we would then try to d distill the ultimate, you know, ultimate in quotes, there are of course no such thing, but one step towards at least a better or. <laughs> Uh, um, a better programming model for for this cloud to edge continuum. I really think that 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 there are you know three main things, uh, and the, these are the three things that we as developers, in my opinion, can never delegate. You know, it's it's, it's first the data the data model, how to model your business data, how to struct how what kind of structure it has, what constraints it should have. What, get, what guarantees you need to have, how you want to query it, and, and so on. The second thing is, is the API. How do you choose to communicate with, with the outside world, 
And how do you want to communicate between services, combine them in workflows and so on? And, and the third one, you know, is, is the business logic. Uh, you know, as the data flows, as these data models are being are flowing, you know, or, or are being invoked. I mean, how uh, what is the business logic that makes it all, you know, tick, so to speak? how to mine intelligence, how to act and operate on data, how to transform and downsample and relay or trigger side effects and, 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 and ensure you know that, that what is side effecting and what is not. I mean, how to use workflow and point-to-point -point communication patterns like point-to-point -point pub, sub, streaming, broadcast, and how to pull it all together. The data model, the API, and all these things around the business logic into one single programming model. I think that's really the key, the key here. But that should be all that we have to focus on, these three things. The rest can, and in my opinion, should be fully managed and fully automated by the underlying platform. And you know, that leads me to Calix. This is really what we sort of the, the, the task that we took on about three years ago uh, and that we've been working on since we launched it in May. Uh, and it's and it's really it's really trying to build this like fully managed developer pass for building real-time event-driven cloud-native and edge-native edge applications. Uh, we, we sort of tried to look beyond the current state of the art of, of serverless today, and not just abstracting you know, what, what functions and service does, but, but actually abstracting away all infrastructure into a single de declarative pro programming model, which means that you don't have to think about the database anymore. You don't see the database. You never see the event brokers. You never see the caches, ne no API gateways, no service meshes. You don't have, can you can actually declaratively configure sec security and so, and, and, and so on. And it's, and it's fully polyglot. You know, Lightman has a history of, of building tools for the JVM with uh, Java and Scala, you know, Play Framework and Arca and, and so on. But Calix is fully polyglot. You can use it from, from many, many, many different lang languages. The ones we, we are officially supporting, supporting right now, only like four months after the launch, is Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, and, and Scala. But you know, there are SDKs in many other languages. And, and as there's a need and demand, we will definitely add more. Uh, it really tries to unify this, this, you know, the idea of cloud native and edge native development into one single programming model, you know, abstracting enough for the runtime to take the decisions of how to most efficiently move data around and, 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 uh, and you know, allowing you through the state models that I talked about is sort of at a high level defined, you know, the, the constraints that you want to have on that data in terms of of, of consistency and the guarantees and data integrity guarantees. Is is it's reactive at its core, low latency, half throughput, it's all running on ACA, gRPC, and and Kubernetes. And uh, it's really sort of embodies this vert vertical integration as a service. You know, you have essentially all of that in Calix. We abstract everything but the business logic. And as I said, you know, the data modeling and the API definitions. But that's all you need to do. The rest is on us. And we operate it, it's fully managed. We operate everything for you. So the question then, how do you build a service in this? Uh, it's, it's three steps, API description, defining your state model, and then finally writing your business logic. So I'll, I'll show you a little example here. In this sample, I'm going to show you our, our declarative sort of API first, contract first uh, SDK. Um, we're, we are working on a code first version. Uh, the first one that come out is, for, is for, for Spring developers. We use Spring annotations to, to define you know, things declaratively, but writing the code. But here in this, since that hasn't been released yet, I'm going to show you here. Uh, uh, one that is based on pro on protobuf for for for, de for defining the schema, but the same ideas hold that you first define your a your your API and your data. So in the in this example, let's create a simple shopping cart, and I'm just going to show you not 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 all of the code, but some of the more important uh, you know pieces of it, so you so you get the idea of how to work with it. So, so let's now define the events and the, and the data model. Uh, we start by defining this add line item event. And there's one 
you know, key uh, as sort of annotation, as, as, as it's called in, 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 in protobuf language, which is this entity key. So we, we set a user ID and we tag that with entity key, Calix field dot entity key. And this is this is uh, this then becomes your, your primary key and, and which is used for routing, for, 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 for querying it, for sharding and many different things. Uh, but apart from that, then we just have the product ID. So, so let's now define an, an API that sort of that that uh, makes makes use of this of this of this event. Here we define a, a service shopping cart and that has one single RPC method here that accepts an add like add line item uh, uh, event. It returns empty here. It doesn't really do anything uh, with a with a return type. Uh, um, so and, and and as you can see here, we have the the, the ability here to add options you know optional annotations here we here we add a google api http annotation uh, uh, that allows us to add sort of a post uri to this which means that you know it will automatically gen gen generate an http endpoint it will it will like by default also generate a grpc endpoint since since you know uh, this uh, this is protobuf you know it goes hand in hand with with grpc but it will additionally sort of, sort of generate also an http endpoint here and and then we also add one option for eventing here in in which we can define the in and out and in reads the event from the event log and we here we can define that as as you know the event log shopping cart and then out uh, we define a topic shopping cart events. So that's that's essentially everything we need to do when it comes to to the API. Of course, there might be more, uh, uh, you know, HTTP endpoints or gRPC endpoints that, that you want to create. But but you know the same logic holds here. The second thing we do is we define a state model. That's sort of the sort of the shape of our domain data. Of course, it's extremely important that you that you pay a lot of uh, uh, um, to, to take a lot of time of defining your domain data, uh, you know, carefully. But once you've sort of thought about how we should how it should be, then it, then you can choose sort of a state model uh, that it should 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 uh, you know behave according to, so 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 to speak. Here here we we have we 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 have said that it should be of the type value entity, which which is our way of saying that it should be a key value type. Uh, uh, but we can just change that with like to event sourced entity by changing one single line of code here. And uh, the third uh, sort of state model that I haven't talked about is sort of data structure type, uh, backed by CR CR CRDTs uh, that are you know a very efficient and very very um, in, in, you know reliable and, and available way of, of, of replicating data. Uh, that is eventually consistent, but it's ensured to always be consistent eventually, so to speak. Uh, then we also have the option here of, of defining, you know, how we should query our data. We we have the notion of, of or, or the concept of views here, so we can we can add a, a gRPC uh, method, we'll say, we'll get 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 cards that returns a stream of cards, and here we can say, okay, now I want to query my my data model by creating you know some sort of a materialized streamable uh, adaptive view and 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 you do that by simply de you know, sort of defining a select statement that are it's not you know ansi sql but it's looks sort of similar to sql uh, and it gives you the ability to query your domain model uh, here we say a uh, select star from cars where user id equals colon user id and that user ID, you know, is the one we we, we saw earlier. Uh, then we also have the option of adding a, an HTTP annotation for this. And in this case, we we, we define as a get and at slash cars, which means that you can then get that this 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 stream like from that URL. We're also currently working on. We haven't released that yet, but but working on supporting joins, which is one of the highest uh, demanded features. Here. So, so now we define the API, our data model, uh, and the third thing is that we need to write our business logic. And here we can choose whatever like favorite language we might have. Here I, I, I chose to to show you know some JavaScript code. So, so the the only thing we need to do here is is to simply define a business logic function. It's essentially you know one line or a couple of lines of code. Uh, 
And and what's what, what's really interesting here, if you if you look at this function add item, that it has three different uh, arguments here, and those are things that are injected into the function as needed. So when an event arrives, it's injected into this function, and the function is invoked. Uh, for example, an, an, in this case, an add item event. But we also inject the state. Uh, you know, the state is outsourced, is managed. I'll talk just more about that just in a second, but it is outsourced or managed on behalf of the function, just as communication uh, eventing is managed on behalf of the function. We also manage state on behalf of the function and inject that accordingly and only inject that when there's new state available. Uh, you always have the latest state without having to go and pull it, you know, all the time. And, and, and by doing so, we can ensure that it's always it's as efficient as absolutely possible. There's no, you know, we don't have, there's no responsibility from the function to do, to, to, to think anything about communication or state management. It's just, it's just injected into the function on an as needed basis. And then we also inject the context for you to, to do, you know, additional things, uh, you know, with in, inside the Kalix environment. And that's it, essentially. It's, it's, uh, it's extremely simple. You know, one of the key innovations I just want to say, talk a little bit more about that is that, you know, we, you know, function as a service allows you to fully abstract over communication. You don't need to, you know, care about how the event arrived into your function. It's just injected into your function, you know, and you are invoked whenever an event comes in, sort of triggers the function. And once you're done with your business logic, doing some sort of action, then you then just emit your event and you're done. That's all that there is to it. You know, it's not your responsibility to, to care at all about how events, you know, are persisted, how they're relayed, et cetera. It's all outsourced to the platform. We do exactly the same thing with state. So we have state in, injected into the function, always the latest one, always as lazy as absolutely possible, but always correct. And and once and once the user function is done, it doesn't need to do anything. You know, as you saw, it doesn't need, even need to return the state. The state is automatically uh, 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 sort of sort of taken care of for you, and 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 uh, you know, if needed, replicated. If needed, uh, sort of stored on disk. If needed, whatever. You know, depending on if it's been updated or not. Um, you know, and and one of the reasons why I think this is extremely important to do is that you know for the the function is a black box to the runtime the runtime can, it really has no idea what's going on inside the function because this developer that writes it and uploads it or or or, or pushes it into into the into, into the platform this mean you know this means that and, and, and that if the if the function is is responsible of managing database access it is really really hard to automate database uh, op oper operations and replication and caching and all of these things. It's really because it's really because since it is a black box to the runtime, it's really hard for, for the runtime to understand the intention of each data access. Uh, you know, for example, is this operation a read or a write operation? C can it be cached safely? Can, can consistency sometimes be relaxed or is, is strong consistency always needed? Can operations proceed during during partitions and, or during failures, or is it like no, we need to stop here and, and reboot? If the runtime can understand these things and actually, you know, sort of see into the function, which it can't, you know, this is why we outsource it. But if it can can manage these things, it can take better decisions automatically. And this becomes even more important as we move to the edge, where you need where you need like radically different ways of, of, of optimizing these things. I mean, examples, for example, is like if, let's say the write operations are really fast, the read operations are really slow. I mean, then we can make sure that we add more mem memory to the, to, the, to the services and to the database and to, to, to the data management. If we're, for example, always reading immutable values, if we know that, I mean, then, then we can safely cache them. And if we, and, and, and if, for example, if we know that writes uh, uh, must be serializable, at all, to, you know, then we can add sharding. So we have single writer per service per entity. So, 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 so in a way, we you know, so we want to constrain database access using well known patterns that we can understand and control. And, and also, you know, look across more than one uh, function. You know, if we, if the platform manages all these functions and everything, all state management is, ex is externalized, 
then we can look across all of these functions and, and, op and optimize you know, database access more, more holistically, more globally, probably not globally, you know, on a global scale, but at least you know, looking across subsystems for more efficiency. So what does it look like under the hood? Uh, uh, it all runs on, 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 Kuber on Kubernetes. We, have, we had what is called our execution cluster. That that you know that can run in many different cloud 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 providers. Uh, you know the execution cluster is where your code is running, and and it's it's wrapped up as a as a as a project. And in I, and this product have services, and each service is, is sort of composed of two different parts. We have what it, what we call the state proxy, uh, or the Calix proxy. Uh, uh, Sidecar is sometimes, uh, um, you know, also what we call it. But the important thing here is that it's, it's like it's always like sitting right next to the user code. And I'll show you how it all works together here. So let's say there's a request coming in from from internet or from from another service or somewhere, you know. Then it, then it, you should, then it hits in this case linker D. There's a relay seat to the right state proxy depending on you know how it's uh, what kind of uh, you know uh, sort of entity keeps coming in. And the state so, so it always hits the state proxy first before it never directly talks to the user code. So the, the state proxy is truly a proxy that always sits, sits in front of it and manages communication and state management on behalf of the user. And, and, and um, I don't want to go too much into detail, but all these state proxies form an ACA cluster, you know, um, sort of that, that functions the same thing as like Dynamo or, 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 or Cassandra, it sort of forms a node ring we're using epidemic gossiping in order to make sure that that that, that everything is and you see cluster sharding to like allocate out all these all these all the state you know in the most efficient way but the important thing you know is that it is the state proxy then 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 and the sort of the state proc this so this network of state proxies then then together can manage the user code or each individual service as efficiently as absolutely possible uh, depending on where it's running, you know, if it's running in the cloud or running, you know, closer to the edge, running, running wherever, it, it can apply a different type of, of, of you know, replication strategies, uh, all within the constraints of how you define your data model, which is, of course, key here. So, in summary, I really believe the cloud, I mean, first, I say, I don't want to rant, you know, cloud computing and, and the cloud infrastructure is amazing today. I mean, I'm blown away and just trying to put myself in my shoes 10 years back, I wouldn't believe it, you know. But it's still too complex, at least, I mean, at the pace that most companies want to, want to move at. And uh, serverless is extremely promising, but it, but it currently falls short. And that's why we created Calix to try to push it forward, you know, making it uh, really live up to what I think its true promise is, even though we're not there yet, of course, we're still working on it. And we need to, uh, continue to to climb this ladder of abstractions. You know, we need to automate as much as possible. Think about less and focus on on delivering value to our customers. We don't want to be down in, in the weeds and 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 you know, staying up at night and 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 wearing beepers and all of that stuff. You know, we just want to focus on building value for our customers, and that's it. And to do so, I think we really need to embrace vertical integration. And not end up with with an integration project at our at our you know hands to maintain indefinitely. Uh, edge computing is is the you know is the natural you know evolution I think to to cloud computing and I see it as really a continuum. It's already here, um, you know, and 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 it opens up a world of possibilities and but also challenges and and and. And of course, you know, opportunities go hand in hand with challenges since there's always a trade-off. But I think we need to start thinking about and seeing it as a, as, as a I mean, we have a cloud to edge continu continuum in which, in which, you know, where we choose to deploy is not something or what, which, actually which tools we use to build the application uh, uh, is completely orthogonal, you know, to, to where we later will deploy it. Uh, uh, it's it, it shouldn't dictate 
we, because we might even not, not know that yet. We might build a cloud application today, but as the edge infrastructure is built out, we might later want to run it closer to the customer. Then we don't want to rewrite it or, or patch it or, or write another system that we need to then start hooking together. Ideally, the platforms should support us in like stretching it out towards the edge as we feel comfortable doing. And to do so, we need to rethink what is absolutely necessary and what can be delegated. And I think I think I think we need a new programming model and developer experience to serve this edge, this cloud to edge continue, continuum. And uh, you know, I I we sort of uh, landed at at you know your data model through 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 data shapes, through I mean, state models, API, and business logic. The rest should really not be be the any concern of for 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 the developer. Uh, the rest should be on the platform, on the cloud providers, on the products, you know, pulling this together for the developer in a fully managed way. And, and you know, and, uh, so Calyx is our modest contribution to this. I mean, Calyx is really here to help you build this type of application. This polyglot is real time, is event driven, is reactive, is based on, you know, 13 years of building these type of systems for, for, for clients, but wrapped up in a very simple function function as a service, you know, but stateful and stateless dress up in a way, fully serverless. And you can use it in the, in the, in the cloud today. We are working on extending this to the edge. We're not fully there yet, but I think we landed at a model that, that um, more or less works, uh, you know, as, as an extension uh, further and further out to the edge. And, and, you know, we're, we are, uh, uh, I think we will, you know, be fully there in, a, in sh shortly, so to speak, but you can definitely use it in the, in the cloud today and, 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 you know, do so. I mean, go to, to drop into calyx.io, sign up uh, to our pay-as-you-go model and let us know what you think, you know, and, and, and uh, let us know what you, what you need, essentially, and, and where we think we have, where, where we're lacking capabilities. We'd love to hear from you. And um, we're very excited about where we're going, I think. And, and I think we're onto something. But uh, uh, as I said, I'd love to hear from 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 you and, and learn from from you know people out there if you're seeing the way the world the way the same way as as I do. So uh, so that was what I had to share today. Uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. I hope I hope it didn't make you all fall asleep. Uh, please reach out, you know, to me uh, or at Asset Lightman if you have any questions. And uh, you can you can find me, you know, on uh, jonasatlightman.com or 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 um, uh, you can find me on Twitter, etc. Okay, thanks. Have a great day or evening, depending on where you are.